I think all of us can agree that after what we saw last night against Oakland, it's very clear. John Calipari needs to go. You are Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what's going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on in to Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Daw. On today's episode of Locked On Kentucky, we are going to be discussing John Calipari's future with the Kentucky Wildcats. I think it's pretty clear he needs to go. We're going to talk about the difference between a resignation and a firing in the direction of this program if he stays or if he leaves. This episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Have you ever wondered what adventure could be around the next corner? Well, you can take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. You can check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. Really appreciate you guys checking out the show today. If you have not subscribed to the show already, whether you are listening on podcast or watching over on YouTube. First of all, appreciate you tuning in. Subscribe. It's going to be a very fascinating offseason here for Locked On Kentucky, just kind of discussing all of the different things that could and are probably going to happen for the Kentucky Wildcats, and one of them we're going to discuss at length today. I think it's pretty clear it's time Kentucky basketball needs to move on from Coach John Calipari. Obviously, Calipari has done a lot of different great things for the Wildcats, but over this past half decade or so, there's been a lack of success. And I think that's where we start here, talking about the reasons why Coach Cal needs to go outside of the result that we saw last night. There are so many different things to indicate that it's time for a separation, a parting of ways, if you will, between these two two uh, entities, uh, Coach Cal Uh, and the Kentucky basketball program. So like I said, reasons why, lack of success for about half of a decade now since the 2019 season where Kentucky lost in the Elite Eight, I believe, to Auburn. The program has just not simply been the same. And I think KSR, Matt Jones, put this really, really well uh, whenever he was discussing uh, the loss to Oakland is over these past few years, you know, you can really start to erase some of these issues with the personalities, with the way things have gone, with the coaching decisions, with the lack of X's and O's, with some of the recruiting things, with all of these different things that have happened with Kentucky basketball. You can erase it all by just winning. And that has not really happened, at least not to the extent that I think this fan base not only wants, but expects from this program, and they should, given the history and the nature of what Kentucky basketball is. It's the winningest program in college basketball history. It's objectively, I think, the best program in college basketball history. There's not really a whole lot of debate. Obviously, you've got your greats like Kansas, Duke, North Carolina, UCLA, but Kentucky sits consistently there at the top, and having this long of a stretch without a lot of really good wins or just wins, period, is really starting to weigh on this fan base. I think you can literally define success as simple as winning. Obviously, there's a lot more intricate details that you could dive into here, but it's the win-loss column that really does bother me. Since 2019, the start of the 2019-2020 season, Kentucky is 15-20 and versus AP Top 25 opponents. That is a 42.8% win rate. In case you are wondering, from the start of Cal's career in 2010, technically 2009, but the 2009-10 season all the way to that 2019 season, Cal was 59-30 and versus AP top 25 opponents. So that is a 66.3% win percentage. So he has taken a 24% win percentage dip when it comes to facing off against really good opponents on his schedule. That does include, by the way, teams that he has faced off against in the NCAA tournament that were ranked in the AP Top 25 whenever he faced off against them in the postseason. They have consistently lost these games against these Top 25 opponents for five straight years, and it sparked a lot of frustration from the fan base. And it's not just the losses, the fact that Kentucky loses games, because that does happen, nobody is perfect. It's some historically embarrassing 
losses. The 2023-24 season, first time Kentucky has lost three straight home games since 1966. Teams that they absolutely could have beaten. One of them, they went on the road and beat at the end of the season in Tennessee. 2023-24 also featured Kentucky's loss to Oakland. Second time Kentucky has lost to a double-digit seed in the first round of the NCAA tournament since its expansion to 64 teams in 1985. 2022, as we all know, lost to St. Peter's. First time Kentucky has lost to a double-digit seed in the first round of the NCAA tournament, again, since its expansion in 1985. Those two losses right there to Oakland and to St. Peter's, not only are they Kentucky's first losses to a double-digit seed in the first round, they are just the third and the fourth losses Kentucky basketball has ever had to a double-digit seed, regardless of what round, period. Kentucky has played 121 seasons, and obviously, since 1985, it's about half of that, um, what that the, of the, of the um, historical data that we're looking at here, where Kentucky has the opportunity to lose to some of these double-digit seeds, but Kentucky's only done it four different times, and twice over the last three seasons. That loss to St. Peter's might have been the most demoralizing, upsetting loss that Kentucky basketball has taken, especially, I think, especially of this past decade. And it, it, it may be one of the most three disheartening losses of the 2000s. Obviously, you can talk about that, the, the Wisconsin game, if I'm not mistaken. You could point to a couple different other games, but that one right there was the most upsetting, at least to me, for Kentucky basketball. Kentucky has 62 NCAA tournament appearances all time in their history. Kentucky, again, lost to a double-digit seed just four times, and that is all according to BigBlueHistory.net, which keeps very deta- a very detailed track of everything going on with Kentucky all the way up until now. This is not some old website, even though it looks like it. They update this thing constantly. I did all of the, uh, of the research for this that I'm talking about today, so let's continue about some of the different losses Kentucky has had and some of the struggles past the wins and losses. Kentucky has failed to make the Sweet 16 for three straight seasons from 2021 through 2024. First time that has happened since the 2005 through 2008 stretch where Tubby Smith was fired uh, right in the middle of that time period. The time before that was 1979 through 1982. So this is something that Kentucky basketball does not do historically. They don't fail to make the, the Sweet 16 or the second weekend of the tournament, period, period. 2023-24, Kentucky gave up an average of 79.7 points per game. That's the fourth worst point total in modern program history and by far the worst of the 2000s. The second closest, I believe, was the 2016-17 season where Kentucky gave up 71.7 points per game. 2021 through 2024, Kentucky loses eight games or more in three straight seasons. First time that has happened since a four-year stretch from 2006 to 2009 that featured the firing of two different coaches, Tubby Smith and Billy Gillespie. I pause for effect there. 2020 through 2021, Kentucky goes 9-16, and 16, a winning, winning percentage of 36%. That's the ninth worst season in Kentucky history by win percentage and the second most losses in a season in program history. Again, 121 seasons of data to look at here. Second most losses in a season. 12 of Kentucky's 25 seasons where they lost double-digit games have come since 2000. Okay, fine. More games, more opportunities to lose, and, and I think less parity, or excuse, excuse me, more parity uh, here as college football basketball has become more modernized. Um, but 12 of those, so 12 of those seasons, six of them were coached by Calipari. Three of them haven't come since 2019. So Kentucky has had their fair share of double digit losses in a season underneath Coach Cal, and three of them recently. Kentucky basketball has failed over these last five seasons and lost some historically embarrassing games, had records broken. Had things happen where you have to look up, you have to look up and say, okay, there must be some sort of change coming, right? Something has to be done about this. What happens if something is done about this? If John Calipari does leave? Well, I want to talk here about the differences between him resigning and the differences between him being fired. Because I think not only does it affect his legacy with the program, it also affects what Kentucky wants to do currently 
with their program, especially when it comes to getting a new coach. Before we dive into that, though, I do want to tell you guys about our friends over at Manscaped introducing this spring season's champ, the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. Their fifth generation trimmer features two interchangeable next gen skin safe blades, a standard one for taking a little bit off the top, and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. It also features a dual LED headless spotlight to guide you through the darkest winter debris. Navigate it with confidence in your delicate areas. Hate making a mess? Not to worry, this bad boy is waterproof. You can shave in the shower, in the bath, or in the ocean. Spring cleaning doesn't just apply to the nether regions. You can get the full grooming experience with Manscaped's signature Beard Hedger Pro Kit and their handyman electric face shaver. You can get 20% off and free shipping with the code Locked On at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code Locked On L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, at manscaped.com. There's nothing like a little spring cleaning. Today's episode is also brought to you by Game Time. Sometimes it really does get frustrating whenever you're trying to buy tickets to a sporting event to go see one of your favorite sports teams. With Major League Baseball coming up, I can only imagine some of these opening day matchups are going to be pretty difficult to get into. Well, there is one place that you need to go where you can shop for tickets stress-free, and that is game time. You should not have to worry when buying tickets to your next big event. And game time, not only are they the fast and easy way to buy all of t- all kinds of tickets for sporting events in your area, but they also have tickets for comedy, music, and theater near you killer last minute deals all in prices and views from your seat and their best price guarantee always means you'll get the best price and experience if you find tickets in the same section and row for less game time will credit you 110 percent of the difference i've absolutely loved using game time here not just through baseball season but also through college football season and i would highly encourage you guys to go check them out it is super easy super quick no hidden fees all up front, super, super awesome app. Take your guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. You can download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On, L O C K E D O N, for 20 bucks off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, continuing along here on the Friday edition of Locked On Kentucky Lance Dahl hanging out here with you again. If you have not subscribed to the show already, I would greatly appreciate it if you went ahead and did so. We surpassed 7,600 subscribers on the YouTube channel, which is super, super awesome. I'm really appreciative of everybody that has joined up. If you are not subscribed and you want to talk more about Kentucky basketball, as I can only assume will get pretty traumatic here over the next few weeks, this is a great place to do it. Sub up. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you're listening on podcast at Locked On UK on Twitter, you can tweet something out and tag me or send me a message if you got questions or just opinions on what's going on with Kentucky basketball. So we talked about how I believe Cal needs to go, and I stated the reasons why, and it's pretty straightforward. There's been a lack of success, and he just simply has not won games that he needed to, at least not enough to make this fan base happy. And there have been a lot of historical things that have happened over these past five seasons, historically bad things that have happened over this half decade that I think really does paint a negative picture for Coach Cal, at least right now. I think it is time for him to go. Question, though, how does Coach Cal leave if he is going to depart? There are two different ways this could happen. He could resign, and there are a couple different things that we need to talk about here if he does end up signing a resignation or he will get fired, and he will be paid a buyout of what is, what is currently $33 million. Let's talk here first about what happens if Coach Cal resigns. I think that if he resigns right now, he is still going to be remembered at UK fondly deep into the future. You are going to remember that stretch from 2010 to 2019, the memories of the wins, the players, the personalities, the excitement, the NCAA tournament runs, 
all of that. You're going to remember that fondly, and you're going to remember that things didn't necessarily go to, as planned towards the end of his career, but if he resigns now, I think there's still enough time on the table for everybody to kind of forgive and forget at least years into the future. If he resigns right now, he also has the opportunity to stay around the program as a special assistant, I believe to the athletic director, if I'm not mistaken. There is a really interesting piece of Cal's contract where he can, if he resigns, be a special assistant to the athletic director slash university representative. It's an option for him to kind of rep the program. I really, really don't know if he would be willing to do this, especially considering comments about this specific part of his contract earlier in this season. But this is what it says in his contract. You go. You can go find this on Twitter. I'm sure you could pull it up on a bunch of different websites as well. Beginning with the sixth contract year of the term, i.e. after June 30th, 2024, coach shall have the option to step down as head men's basketball coach and become special assistant to the athletic director slash university representative special AD assistant. Coach shall exercise this option by providing the university president and the athletic director written notice as provided in section 11 below by April 15th of the of the preceding contract year. For illustration, if coach wish, wishes to exercise this option after the 2023-24 season for the sixth contract year of the term, he shall provide notice by April 15th, 2024. If he remains head men's basketball coach for the 2024-25 season and sixth contract year and wants to exercise this option for the seventh contract year, he shall provide notice by April 15th, 2025. If the term of this agreement in Section 1 is extended by written amendment, this special ADS position shall extend to the end of the extended term. So, Coach Cal has the opportunity within the next three weeks to resign and become a special assistant as, or some type of, of university rep if he would choose to do so. Now, obviously, he would be taking a significant pay cut relative to what his buyout would be if he were to do this. But again, I think this ties into getting him to step down and be remembered fondly for what he did for this program. Because despite these five years of frustration, there was 10 years of success before this that everybody loved and adored. A lot of people still really like this guy, even though they believe there should become some kind of split. And I really do think after... Listening to ESPN Louisville, listening to KSR, listening to you guys, listening to people actually use their voices, not just write, but use their voices and talk about this man and talk about the surroundings in Lexington and their emotions behind what has happened over the past few years. Everybody, well, not everybody, almost everyone has some sort of like odd calmness about them where there's so much respect here for Coach Cal still. And I think there, there definitely should still be but also at the same time, everyone acknowledges it's time to make a change. There are very few people out there that I've seen where they're just grabbing their torches and pitchforks and going, rah, 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 Cal needs to be fired, burn him, he, we, we got to get him out of here. A lot of people are just very calmly saying, including myself, it's probably time for him to go. And there's enough, I think there's enough here to really make that claim. So if he resigns now then you're going to have the chance to really start to paint a more positive picture while maintaining him for the program. You also, well, extra, extra bonus, don't have to pay that massive buyout. As opposed to him getting fired. Obviously, the two negative things here, he will have to get the buyout. $33 million is going to be really difficult for Kentucky to come up with. And to be honest with you, I think it's the primary reason that is holding them back from doing it, and it's probably what's going to hold them back from firing him, period. I believe, as of today, he's probably going to be Kentucky's coach for the 2024-25 season. That's just what we're stuck with. And if he does get fired, and we do have to pay the buyout, I think a lot of people are going to remember him negatively for what was his, what were his failings here towards the end of Kentucky's career because you won't have the label of resignation or the things that he could do positively for this program in this school after he resigns and in a new position, obviously, as some university rep, but he would be fired. He would be done. He'd be gone. He'd be off to some other school or something like that. And people would say, yeah, we ran him out of town after he failed to do anything for five straight seasons as opposed to a res resignation and then kind of like maybe making some stuff up towards the end of his 
work career, period. So if he's fired, I think things can be a lot more negative. Obviously, if either of these two things happen, Kentucky should be very excited about an opportunity to look for some new coach. Although I will say, before they do either of these two things, if either of them happen, and I think that there's a, a, a low chance that both of them do, I want it to happen. I think it should, but will it actually happen? I'm not quite sure. I would say no. If either of them do happen, Kentucky has to have a very, very, very good idea of where they're going to go for their next head coach. Where are you going to find your next coach? And to be honest with you, some of the coaches that they may be looking at are currently in the midst of March Madness runs. A couple of them have already lost. And I'm not telling you right now that I know anything. I know nothing about what Kentucky basketball could do here. And quite frankly, I don't think anybody really knows uh, what Kentucky's going to do. Um, even the people that are making the decisions themselves. I'm just telling you, the options that this fan base would present and the options that whatever PR firm they hire, or whatever firm they hire to go take a look at this, they are going to be looking at some coaches that are still in the midst of working and still in the midst of doing these different things with the tournament uh, and X, Y, and Z. So Kentucky, I think, has a very limited time frame here to kind of make all this happen with a resignation before April 15th and then with this NCAA tournament still going, with some prospects in the coaching pool still doing their thing, what does Kentucky do? I think it's probably a good thing that this does not draw out for another month and a half, two months. I think it's good that Kentucky has to make a decision now because if they do end up losing him, you're probably going to lose some different things that you would have had in 2024-25, primarily some of these recruits. And so that's kind of what I want to wrap up this uh, the show talking about if Cal doesn't go, what happens? What happens if we're we are just stuck with it again for another year, minimum? Let's discuss that in just a second. Before I do that, I do want to tell you guys about our friends over at Nissan. This week's March Madness bracket highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we are picking one team that stands out, a team that has pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These teams were able to take it to the next level. And the Arizona Wildcats can only be described as an armada. This two-seat is as hardcore as it gets out there. It's no wonder they took it to Long Beach State in the first round of the NCAA tournament. They are a favorite picked by many to make a run, and we'll face Dayton this weekend for a chance to go to the Sweet 16. You can take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. You can shop all of those SUVs over at NissanUSA.com. That is NissanUSA.com. All right, wrapping up the Friday edition of Locked On, Kentucky Lance Dahl hanging out here with you. If you've got any thoughts on Cal, on the situation, on the program... You can leave all of those in the comments below, again, at Locked On UK on socials if you want to check me out there. So we've talked about why Cal should go. We've talked about what would happen if Cal went in certain situations. And now I want to talk about what happens if Cal doesn't go. What if he does not leave this program? And this is probably the storyline we're going to be talking about for the next, I don't know, five months, six months. If Cal doesn't go, how much of the fan base do you lose heading into the fall? And you may say, what defines losing the fan base? Well, fan base, define that yourself. If Coach Cal does come back this season, how will you react? What will your reaction be? Will you step away? Will you stop watching Kentucky basketball? Most of you probably won't. But let me tell you what I guarantee some of you will do. And some of you have already told me that you are going to do. You're going to stop buying season tickets. You're going to stop going to Rupp Arena. Who wants to watch this team and this program with this man running it? If they're just going to continue to lose and continue to look awful in certain regards. Defense, rebounding, grit, etc. You're not going to be as invested. And so... I will ask you again, how do you find it define your emotions if Cal returns? Where do you stand? Will you be one of the lost group of people that just decides to kind of 
push themselves away from the program until a change is made. How is how are you going to react? What could pull things back around? What could kind of drive things in Cal's favor here if he does not go? What's the what's the other side of this? If there's the drama of losing losing investment from the fan base, what are some things that could draw them back in? Well, we've seen this for a few years in a row now, and I think it's pretty clear what could drive the fan base back in. It's the recruiting and the offseason hype. We saw this last year. If you guys don't remember, and I know you do, after losing to Kansas State for the next few weeks, the, the, the topic of conversation was Oscar Shibway, whether or not he would return, and all of the losses that Kentucky basketball was taking. Oh my goodness, we're losing we're losing Jacob Toppin. We're losing Severe Wheeler. We're probably going to lose Shibway. We're losing all these different players. Damian Collins is leaving X, Y, and Z. And then the transfer portal happened. <laughs> and Kentucky couldn't do jack in the transfer portal. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't get a single player. Keyshaw Johnson wanted him really bad. Went to Arizona. He's actually playing out of his freaking mind this season at the power forward spot. Kentucky would have loved to have had his veteran presence on this team this season. Hunter Dickinson. Tried to throw a bunch of money at him. Tried to get him to come here. Him and his punk attitude. He went to uh, he went to Kansas, and um, is currently still playing in the NCAA tournament. Props to him for balling out. Um, Kentucky lost out on him. They are probably going to struggle again in the portal this season, and it's one of the things that could pull this fan base back around. It's the transfer portal, but I think we know that heading into it, and so I do think that there's a question that we have to ask. Okay, if we're if we're going into this knowing the transfer portal is going to be a factor in whether or not the fan base emotionally kind of reinvests for another time, what should the expectations be? Because there's a difference between what's what are expectations, what are reality. Reality is Kentucky sucks in the transfer portal, and that's why they're trying to do things like get NIL together. That's why they're trying to do things like um, like, like find the right guys um, to fit uh, within their system and, uh, and, and actually do it properly. I don't think Kentucky sucks in the transfer portal necessarily for a lack of, of trying, per se, with some of these different guys that they really, really want, but it does feel like they just, they just cannot execute because of the lack of investment in... NIL funds. They try and go out and get these different guys, Johnson, Hunter Dickinson, uh, whoever you wanted to talk about last season um, that maybe Kentucky was interested in. And they per- and they pursued they pursued the guys that they wanted. Obviously there were a ton of different guys that they just kind of said, "Eh, we don't we don't want or need them." But at the end of the day, what these kids are going to be looking for is money. And, and so far, this program has not really shown an extremely strong interest in throwing the bag at these kids. And I think that may harm them. The expectation is Kentucky's going to go get two of the top 15 players in the transfer portal, three of the top 15 tra- uh, players in the transfer portal, and they're, they're going to be able to reload and get some veteran experience on this team finally. But the reality of the situation is they're probably going to go after one or two guys that they really want whiff on both of them. Probably what's going to happen. And then the recruiting class here. Talk about expectations. What could pull things back around outside of the portal, which is iffy, like I just said, in its own right. But the recruiting class, you know, you're looking at these different guys. I got them pulled up right here. Jaden Quaintance, 17 years old, five-star. Just big, physical kid. How much is he going to be able to produce alongside a guy like Samto Cyril? 6'10", 240. Two freshman centers. You're going to need another big. Is it Ivasic? Is it Onyenzo? Neither of those guys could protect the rim this season worth a rip. Are you going to want them back? Are you going to try and develop them further? Are you going to get a transfer portal player? What's going to what's gonna happen there? For me, I'm excited about these guys individually, but I don't, I, I don't, get, I don't get fired up about who they are without pieces surrounding them. Boogie Fland, decent guard, coming out of high school, could be a good score, could play at, play at the one or the two. You've got Carter Knox, who I think will probably be the best scorer out of this group, Billy Richmond at shooting guard. Travis Perry at point. 
Like these these guys, cool. Like individually, they've got things going on. But how do they gel and and be successful against the SEC? Do we really think that Kentucky in back to back seasons is going to get out of this group a Rob Dillingham and a Reed Shepard? And even if they do, is this coaching staff and is this coach going to be able to act, actually utilize that talent effectively? I like Quaidens. I like Fland, Cyril, Perry, Knox, Rich, Richmond. I'm excited to varying degrees about every single one of these players. I think they all have upside, and I'm excited to see what they do. But you don't really have a ton of clear answers as to how well you're going to be able to attack the portal. You do not have, well, I'm sorry, you do have a clear answer as to whether or not your coach can utilize your talent well. He's failed to do it for five straight years. And you don't have a good answer as to whether or not you're going to be able to develop these guys like you did uh, Reeves, Dillingham, Shepard. I mean, it's it's very difficult to hit like that on back-to-back recruiting classes. Are you going to see these guys step up and play like that? Also, another question, talking about just, just coaching and X's and O's, are you going to revert back after this year? The way that the offense played, are you going to do it again? Because I have my doubts. Knowing Coach Cal, knowing the fact that he said after the game against Oakland that he's going to have a hard time changing. I mean, he'll look at a couple different things, but he's going to have a hard time changing. Something tells me you're not going to see the same offense next season. You're not going to see the same pace. You're not going to see the, the same tempo. I think part of it is because of the personnel coming in. I think part of it is because he's going to go back to what he knows. He's going to go back to what he's had for 15 years. And it's not been successful for five, but he's going to go back to it. You, the, the old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. It feels like this year, the trainer tried to teach the old dog the new trick. And he almost got it. The dog almost got it all the way through, but he just missed at the very end. He missed an important detail. And he's just never going to be able to complete it. He doesn't have enough time. Doesn't have enough time to learn. And is, quite frankly, not willing to learn. He is who he is. The dog is set in his ways. And at some point, you got to realize that's just who he is. And if you're not okay with that, and you've done everything you can, maybe it's time to go get another dog. That's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Kentucky. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On UK. You can follow me on Twitter at Lance Dahl underscore, and follow the show over on Instagram. That is at Kentucky Podcast. Any questions, comments, concerns, leave those in the YouTube comments below. Hit me on the socials. I will see you all on Monday for another episode of Locked On Kentucky. Have a great rest of your day, everybody, and God bless.